Audie Murphy. Audie Murphy. He was an army soldier in World War II. Uh, his, his, his unit was tasked with fighting off and holding a line against a German counterattack. As they are holding this line, it was a very important line to hold so that they could, they could keep their, the rest of their unit safe. They're holding this line, fighting back and forth. As they're doing that, their M10 army tank is shot and catches fire. And so as the rest of the unit starts running away and fleeing away from this line that they're trying to hold, Adi does something that is unbelievable. And he runs and he jumps on top of the, 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 the what, is that, what is that? The tank. Thank you. Thank you for my mind working, I guess. Uh, but the tank, he runs and he jumps onto the tank and he grabs the 50 caliber gun and he starts shooting as the tank is on fire and he's shooting, holding this line. And they say that this shooting and this battle between Adi and his tank and the Germans lasted for over an hour. As the tank is engulfed in flames and he's shooting and his friends are literally running the other way, Adi's fighting back and forth and trying to hold this line. Said that he, he actually uh, took out over 50 German soldiers on his own holding this line. Now, eventually, after this battle and after the war, he was awarded the Medal of Honor, which is the highest award for our our military service members. Since the beginning of, or the intro of the Medal of Honor in 1863, excuse me, only th around 3,500 medals of honor have been awarded. So it's very high honor. Now we hear stories like that, and I don't know about you, but it does something inside of me where it rises this pride and this thankfulness and this honor that we have for people that serve our country and have fought for our freedoms. There's a sense of wow and honor, like, ugh, I can't even imagine doing something like that. What kind of person jumps into harm's way to do something like that? And it, pride rises up, and it should because it's natural. Have you, I don't know if you've ever seen the videos that go viral where a soldier is coming back in the airport, and as he's walking through the airport, everybody stands up, and they give him a standing ovation, and they're clapping, and they're cheering, and it's like this emotion. It's like those, those, those videos that you watch, and like you're, you're wondering why like, I can't stop crying because it's so emotional, and it's so, you're so thankful for what has taken place. It's natural. It's moving. Now, we see this sense of honor even through our history, even today, when the president of the United States gets off of Air Force One, what do we see at the bottom of the stairs? We see soldiers saluting the commander-in-chief. We see it in the royal family, even, even in that way, to where people will either do a neck bow or a curtsy, and I'm not going to show you what that looks like uh, today, but they even honor and they respect the people that are in higher office or higher standing. It's this outward expression of their thankfulness for their service. Even in the ancient world, many times you were required to bow before the king. Lay, lay your face to the ground, get on your knees before the king, and, and, and you, you do that as a sign of honor and reverence to the person you are in the presence of. Now, not to be a trickster or to what I call Jesus juke us this morning, but how do we respond to God when we are in awe and thankfulness and reverence to him? How do we respond in reverence and awe to God? How do we do that? Uh, worship, and especially modern worship, has become a hotly debated topic. People get very, very riled up about the, the topic of worship, but what, what worship should look like, what worship should sound like. And a lot of reasons that we are divided in our churches today is because of even just something as simple as style of worship. And I get it because I want to go to a church where I enjoy the worship. I, there's, there's parts of that, but worship's become this thing that we focus on and we say, like, I'm going to go to this church because I like this, and I'm going to go to that church because I like this. Uh, and then you have churches that have no, no, no instruments, and it's just voices, and there's something beautiful about that as well. There's all these different changes and different views. So we've been in this series called Made to Worship. This is actually our seventh week uh, that we've been doing this, and I've been enjoying it. Um, but in this, we've been looking at a biblical view of worship. What does it look, to have a, look like to have a biblical view of worship? Because we know that worship is not just a song. It's not just a moment in a service. It's not just the staff, staff position that a church hires out for to have a worship pastor. It's, it's the whole of our lives. So how do, we, how do we have a biblical view of worship? So we've looked anywhere from Genesis to Revelation. Uh, but today we're going to zero in on something that 
uh, we most would say this is what they consider worship. We're going to zero in on expression in worship. What does it mean to have expression in worship? It's what people naturally think of. Uh, just as we would respond to a soldier in thankfulness, how do we respond in worship to God from a biblical viewpoint? Did you know that these scriptures are full of a commands or even encouragement to respond to God in a bodily form? If you read throughout the scriptures, if you read, uh, a lot of people start a Bible reading plan in January, and they read from January to December, and you read in this, this throughout the scriptures, you'll see this theme of, of, of commands and encouragements to worship God with your body and how you respond, expressions in worship, commands to raise hands and encouragement and people bowing before God. But we also know that there are many ways to worship God. It's not simply just to raise your hands. It's not, it's not simplistic in that way. It's much more nuanced than that. But today we want to lean into this tension of the commands of God to the commands of scripture to worship him with our body and how we express ourselves in worship, but also know that there's different styles and different, different methods of worship, knowing that it's not going to be one size fits all for everybody depending on how you were raised, if you were raised in church or what denomination you grew up in, you might lean one way or the other. I grew up, obviously, in a very expressive culture, grew up in a worshipful culture. I, you know, was, you were out of the norm if you weren't raising your hands or singing loud or clapping loud. That was kind of the church world that I grew up in. Might see somebody dance every once in a while or run around a sanctuary. We did get crazy every once in a while. But depending on how we were raised or if you were even grown up in church or maybe you're new to Christianity, you walk in the room, you're like, what are these people even singing to? And so you have all these different things that we walk into this room with. And so we want to lean into, not, not ignore, we want to lean into the tension of the commands of scripture and how we feel and kind of work through some of those things today. So I would challenge us, let's drop our preconceived ideas this morning of what worship is or what worship is supposed to be. And let's look and tune our hearts to the scriptures of what he has to say to us. We're going to be in Psalms chapter 150, the last Psalm today. If you have your Bibles, you can turn there. And here's, here's uh, something I will tell you up front. We're going to work through a lot of scripture today, and some of them are going to be fast. So if you want to follow, you can take pictures on the screen. You can look at them up later. I encourage you to do that. But they're going to move fast through some of them, not Psalms 150, but as we get a little bit later, just a little bit of a warning. So buckle up, right? That's what it says. Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him for his mighty deeds. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise him with trumpet sound. Praise him with the lute and harp. Praise him with the tambourine and dance. Praise him with strings and pipe. Praise him with sounding cymbals and praise him with loud clashing cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. And lastly, again, praise the Lord. Now, uh, I, I shared this story earlier, uh, but my kids are here this morning, so they get to hear it. Uh, but we have been gifted a few years ago by my dad a drum set. Thanks, Dad. It is quite loud when they get to hitting on the drums, and they're, they're banging on the cymbal, they're banging on the kick drum. And just the other day, we were sitting outside in the front yard uh, playing, and, and our neighbor walks out, and he, and he asks us, hey, uh, do you guys have a drum set? <laughs> Why, yes, we do. You should come in and hear it. It's lovely. It's loud. It gets loud. It's a, you, you see this passage in Psalms chapter 150. It's a beautiful psalm. And really, the last few chapters of psalm are some, Psalms are some of the most beautiful parts of Scripture. It's all about turning their, our attention and our focus on Christ and praising God and lifting up our voices and lifting up our hands. It's beautiful. It turns all their attention to the glory and the majesty of God. But did you notice a trend in the passage? Praise. It says it 12 times in six verses, praise, 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 over and over. Praise him this way, praise him that way, praise him this way, praise him that way. And it's sometimes, it's even hard to read as, I'm re I, was, as I was reading out loud. I'm like, I get the point after like three verses, right? But it's praise, praise, praise. 12 times he says it in six verses. In Hebrew, this means to boast. It's a celebration. It's, an, it's to exalt God. It's to in a sense, make a joyful noise to the Lord. Could you imagine hearing the lute and the harp and the tambourines and the trumpets and the drums and the cymbals and clashing together and voices lifted up? All in praise to God. Amen. 
That doesn't sound like a lot of the worship cultures that we see in our churches today. This joyous, joyful sound that we make to the Lord, that we're singing with our voices and we have mus- musicians playing instruments and making beautiful sounds to the Lord. We, but what, what we see in our culture today, we see, we'll, see, we'll sing songs about uh, a joyful, being joyful before the Lord and we have like the nastiest look on our face. I guess, you know, I give joy to the Lord. Yeah, it's great, happy. You know, if we sing songs that have a celebratory feel and we can barely muster enough energy to clap and it's like... You, you see, you see that like, it, it contradicts to what, what Psalms 150 is saying here. And I, I say that jokingly, and I know it's kind of tongue-in-cheek, but there is some truth in there. That we see that the scriptures call us to this life of worship as well as an act of worship in a moment, in a setting like we would see here, and to make a noise to the Lord, to sing out, to lift our hands to him. Now, we don't have trumpets um, we don't have harps, and I would venture to say that most of us aren't going to be dancing in worship. But the psalmist is trying to get the point across to us that we are to make a joyful noise to the Lord, not for the sake of noise. This is important. This is a very important distinction. Not for the sake of noise, but for the glory of God. Our worship is never for attention. Our worship is never for a noise or a sound. It's always and should always be for the glory of God. Now, how do we reconcile a passage like that that says praise, praise, praise? Make a joyful noise. Make sounds with instruments. Make sounds with your voices. Lift your hands to God. How do we reconcile a passage like that? And then also with, with, with the reserve culture that some of us have grown up in. Again, that's the tension that we want to lean in today. The uh, main idea, if you're taking notes, is this. Expression in worship includes the posture of the body and the posture of our heart. Expression in worship includes the posture of our body and the posture of our heart. And what I would like for us to do this morning is to deconstruct a little bit, to separate the body from the, the body from the heart, the posture of the body and the posture of the heart, separate those, deconstruct them and reconstruct them towards the end of our message so we can see what a biblical view of worship should look like or an encouragement for all of us to do that. So let's first look at the posture of the body. Now, our, we know this, so that our bodies... And how we act can tell a lot about what we feel or what we believe. We learn this very quickly in marriage, don't we? You ever ask the question, or has your spouse ever asked the question, are you okay? And you hear the words, fine, I'm fine. That's usually not okay, right? Especially for me, if if I'm like, I'm fine, I'm fine. Like, you can say you're fine, right? And I've had to learn this, and my wife has done a great job of trying to encourage me. Like, well, your face doesn't look like you're fine. Because my jaw's clenched. I have, like, a tell. Like, if I'm mad, don't, don't tell them, y'all don't spread this. But if I'm mad, my jaw gets really tight, and people can tell. And my dad can tell from, like, a thousand miles away. He's like, why are you upset? And I'm like, I'm fine. You can say you're fine, but if you're slamming stuff around the house, right? Like, your actions are saying you're not fine. Our bodies communicate something, we, and depending on the study, around seven, between 70 to 90% of our communication is all nonverbal. And so as we think through some of those things, we communicate with our body more than we like to admit. So what does worship and the posture of our bodies mean when it comes to worship? Now, this is so interesting to me, the two main words that are translated in both the Hebrew and in the Greek, for, so the Old Testament in the New Testament, both words that are translated as worship in our Bible actually carry a meaning in an action of bowing down, or in the, in the Greek, it's called proskuneo, or proskuneo, there, there you go, proskuneo, and it is to lay prostrate before the Lord, to lay down face ground before the Lord. So what we see as worship, to worship the Lord, that we read in the Old Testament and the New Testament, is actually a symbol, and there's an action to it. In the Old Testament, it's a bow, and in the New Testament, it's a lay prostrate before the Lord. Isn't that interesting? We don't hear about that much. We hear lift your voices and lift your hands, and those things are great. But just as a king in the ancient world or a member of a royal family would be bowed down to, how much more should it mean for us to lay ourselves before the Lord and to kneel before the Lord. Now, this isn't prescriptive in the sense that 
We are, we are called into scriptures to do this every time. It doesn't mean that every time you come into worship that you need to, like, I, I, it'd be kind of hard, it'd be a big ask for me to have you put your face on the school floor here this morning. <laughs> I think y'all would go some places. You maybe not go there, all right? Uh, but to kneel before the Lord, to lay before the Lord, there is something that happens in our hearts, in our minds, when we posture ourselves in a, in a, symbol way, in a symbolic way of humbleness, to the creator, to the one that has authority over us, and we bow before him in worship. It's a sign of submission and reverence to God. Now, as there is a modern push towards intellectualism, and it's almost like that we see these two, side, two extreme sides. You have those that it's all action, and it's all movement, and it's a lot of noise, and then you have those that Go to the other side, and it's like, it's all heart, and it's like, I, this is how I worship, and it's very stoic. But I would say that the, the scriptures encourage us and even sometimes command us in bodily movement, but I don't know how you can learn a lot about Christ and the work that he has accomplished and, not, and it not drive you to worship. That is not a slight towards the intellectual. I have some friends or some of the smartest people I believe in the city, wise, wise people. So it's not, a, it's not a slight at learning and growing in knowledge. I, we should do that. You should do that. I, I admire people that can read a book and remember what it says. I admire people that have knowledge and they can just pop off things like off the top of their head. And it's like, wow, just how do, how do you get to that place? I admire that. So I'm not saying that we don't have wisdom and we don't search out wisdom and search out knowledge. But what I am saying is that it shouldn't just be all about action. It shouldn't all be about getting the, the hands and the loud noises, but it shouldn't also be about a stoic life. The way that I read the scripture when worship comes, it's a combination of both. Now I want us to look at just a few scriptures on worship this morning and with the body. And, and normally we would spend time breaking these down uh, and exegeting these passages and these scriptures. And here's exactly what it means, but I want to work through these pretty quickly. So we're going to jump to the first one. Genesis chapter 17, verses three and four. It's what it says. Then Abraham fell on his face and God said to him, behold, my covenant is with you and you shall be the father of, of a multitude of nations. You notice in verse three, then Abram, this is before the covenant, God made the covenant with him. He changed his name to Abraham. He was going to be the father of many nations. That's why we sing father Abraham throughout all of our uh, children's church life. If you grew up in church, but just as God was giving, this, giving Abraham this covered covenant, he, his natural response was to fall on his face before the Lord in his spontaneous act of worship. Where does something like that come from? Where does something like that come from? It only comes from a heart that is full of worship and adoration to the one that they are serving. Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 6 told you we're going to move quick through these. And Ezra, bless the Lord, the great God, love that, the great God, and all the people answered, amen, amen, lifting up their hands, and they bowed their heads, and they worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. This is one of my favorite chapters in the entire Bible. Nehemiah, as he instructs and leads the Israelites to rebuild the city of Jerusalem, the walls of Jerusalem, and they build them, and they finish, they complete, and Ezra stands up and he reads the law of the Lord. Now, when you hear that phrase, the law of the Lord, they're talking about the first five books of the Bible, the Torah, and they're reading the law of the Lord. And it says from morning to noon, from morning to midday, he reads the law of the Lord. And they start shouting in amens and they start lifting their hands and they bow their heads. They put their face to the ground. No musical instruments that we can tell in this passage, just pure worship bowing down to the Father. What a beautiful sight that must have been to have the people of Israel and to see them hearing the words of God recited to them, bowing down in worship to the one that has rescued them and saved them from the hands of Egypt and from people all throughout their history and just to say, Jesus, you are, God, you are worthy. Psalms 134 verse 2 says this, lift up your hands in the whole, to the holy place and bless the Lord. Again, we see lifting up the hands. It's a common one in worship. 
It's what we sing songs about. It. We lift up holy hands. Worship leaders encourage it, lifting up our hands. Psalms chapter 5, verse 7. But I, through the abundance of your steadfast love, will, uh, steadfast love will enter your house, and I will bow down towards your holy temple in the fear of you. Bowing down again in the temple of the Lord as a symbol of fear and awe and wonder. That this, this sense that we have sometimes lost in our culture, in our world, that we don't, we don't have this fear of healthy fear of God. Submission to the authority and the supremacy of God. And then 2 Samuel chapter 6, verse 14. And David danced before the Lord with all his might, and David was wearing a linen ephod. Now, this might be the only one that I don't encourage you to do. We don't want to see anybody dancing in undergarments. But yes, dancing, even dancing, the scriptures say, is a way to worship the Lord because you are so overcome with joy that you're just like, I'm, I can't hold it. I'm going to worship God. What I want for us to see is that all throughout Scripture, there is a call for us to express ourselves in worship. Scriptures are full of commands and encouragements to worship and express ourselves, to see the posture of the body. But it doesn't stop there, because if we look now, we're going to look at the posture of the heart. Worship, worship is an outward expression of our inward belief about God. Worship is an outward expression of our inward belief, and I believe that a true understanding of Christ and the work that he did, the true understanding of grace, will drive us to worship. I mean, when, when we think about what God has done for us, that he's rescued us, and we know, all of us know the depths of our soul. We know how dark it can be in our own minds and our own souls if we are not being ruled by the creator of the universe. We know our darkness, don't we? But to know that we've been rescued from that darkness, not because of any of our work, but because of the work of Christ, wow. If that doesn't drive us to worship and to, to fall on our faces before the Lord, I don't know if anything else will. But this outward expression is, is about our, it's about our inward beliefs. But again, there's this tension. There's the call from scriptures to express ourselves in worship. We fall on our face and our knees. We lift our hands and our voices. But we know this as well. Just because someone lifts their hands or they make a lot of noise, they sing really loud or they shout really loud, does not mean that they're worshiping. This is, I want you to hear me very clearly on this. Worship is never separated from the motives of our heart. Worship is never separated from the motives of our heart. It's the belief in our heart that the actions flow from. It's not a, it's, it's not a fake it until we make it kind of thing that we, we, would, we would say when I was growing up. Like, fake it till you make it. Like, you'll, you'll get it at some point. It's like, no. Our hearts we need to be in the right place if we're going to worship. Because here's the reality is that Jesus' harshest critique was geared toward those who had everything, what it seemed like, everything together on the outside. That they looked holy, they acted holy, and they worshiped the right way. They did all the things, but their heart was not in the right place. Matthew chapter 23, verse 27 and 28. It says this, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! Don't we love that world in our culture today? People throw it around. Hypocrites. For you are like whitewashed tombs, which outwardly appear beautiful. You're worshiping. Everything looks great. You are, yeah, you, you've just got this following God thing down. But within, you are, within are full of dead people's bones and uncleanness. So you also outwardly appear righteous to others, but within you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Jesus' harshest critique were towards those that had the look of everything. Like, uh, you know, I, 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 this is like transparency 101 for me. I could do this as a teenager. I got really good at faking it and acting like my life was just great and I've got it all together. Meanwhile, I was struggling through sin and, and different things that I was battling through as a teenager, not wanting to tell anybody because I had this perfect Christian life portrayed for everybody to see. Jesus drops this nugget of wisdom. Outside of everything looks great. 
you've, you've got that part going on, but something's missing. You're full of hypocrisy. You're full of dead man's bones because inside your heart is missing from it. It is never just about our outward actions. You could, if you were to be bold and brave and just do something drastic, you could give your entire yearly salary to the poor, to a mission field, to a missionary. But if your heart is to be noticed, you've missed the point. If your heart is to be seen or to be looked at and say, wow, look what that person did. They are just so spiritual. They've, they've, just, they've just got, like their life just must be great because they've, they're giving their money away to the poor and to the missionaries. If our heart's not in it for the right reason, then it's not worship anymore. We could run, we could shout, we could dance, we could lift our hands. But if your heart isn't to glorify God, then we've missed the point of worship. You see where, where, where we're getting at here today is that if your motive is to be seen, then you've missed it. It always, always starts with the heart. Someone that sings and lifts their voice to God and does it with their heart tuned to God is more worship than someone that is making a bunch of noise to get noticed. Worship starts and begins with a deep adoration inside of our hearts of the one that has saved us and rescued us from the depths of our darkness and sin. It's where it starts. It doesn't start with a song. It starts before you ever walk into this room. It starts before you ever play a worship song on your phone. It starts in your heart to where your heart is consumed with adoration and love for the one that has rescued us. And when we can start to grasp that and understand that we, ha we have to prepare ourselves for worship and our hearts are tuned to him and we are, we are pushing all of our attention towards him. When we can start to grasp that, that's when we're gonna start to see worship flow out of our lives. Now here's the third thing. So you have the body posture, you have the heart posture, and this is what I would believe is the biblical posture. Josh and team, you can come. True biblical worship is a combined posture. It's a posture of the heart and it's a posture of the body. It's a combined posture. Now, a heart that is tuned to the glory of God and a body that keeps a posture of worship, I'm not here to tell you what that posture is. I'm not here to tell you exactly how you should worship, but it is a heart that is tuned to God and it's a body that keeps a, po a posture of worship as an overflow of an inward delighting of God. Here is the question, or here is, here is a question for us this morning. Are you delighting in and are you enjoying God? It's a simple question, but it's a hard one to answer. Some of you may be in a very difficult season in a very difficult time, you're walking through trials and struggles and tribulations. And you have all these things that are going on in your life and there's challenges there. And so it may be hard to say, yes, I'm delighting in God. But true delight, true trusting in Jesus does not only delight in him when things are great and when things are well. It's saying no matter what, I look out in my life and I see circumstances, no matter what those circumstances look like, I'm delighting in Christ. I'm going to spend time with Christ. I'm going to enjoy him. We've been working with our kids on the catechisms. What's the chief end of man? It's to glorify God and enjoy him forever. Are you delighting in him? Are you enjoying your relationship with God? Because that's where worship starts. And here's what I want, here's what I want you to hear this morning is that I'm not here to tell you how you are supposed to worship. But I do want us to look at the scriptures that we've seen today and ask ourselves, what does worship look like for me? Do I take it lightly? Maybe. Maybe it depends on the weekend, week. Maybe it depends on which Sunday it is or what happened before you walked in. What does worship look like for me? How do I worship God with my heart and my posture? I get that there's 
different personalities and you have introverts and you have extroverts. I come from a pretty expressive family. I, I don't know, I, I get excited about everything. I was telling Josh like I, this week as I was preparing for this message, like this is not Christian, so don't do this. Um, but when I played sports, I, I, was, I was a trash talker. I, I, went, I was just, I would like just, ah, just let it all out, let it go. Cause I, I'm expressive, whatever I'm doing, whatever I'm in, I'm like, I'm all in it. And so for me, it seems like natural, like, yeah, I'm gonna raise my hands or I'm gonna clap and I'm gonna sing like, oh yeah, fine, whatever. But there's some that are introverts and you hear that and you're like, I might die right here if you ask me to do something. So there's that tension, but what are we doing? We're leaning into that tension this morning. So we put our feelings and our upbringings and all that to the side. And we say, what does the scripture say about worship? Not, not what, what do I feel about worship? What does the scripture say about worship? Here's the, here's the truth that you need to rest in. God created you and that includes your personality. So he knows who you are. So why I'm not gonna tell you what you should do in worship God knows you, he created you, so he knows what your worship is. But the flip side of that is this. If there is something that is keeping you from worshiping God, that's where the problem is. If it, is, it, if it, is it pride? Is it a hard heart? Is there something in you that you need God to work on and show you that, hey, maybe you're not worshiping because of this. That's where the problem is. The problem, the problem is not whether or not you sing as loud as you can at the top of your lungs, or if you raise your hands as high as you can to the sky, or you fall to your face and kneel before the Lord. That, that's, that's not what I'm trying to get. The point is, is, are you worshiping God with your heart? But if you're not, what is keeping you from doing that? Here's what I believe and here's what I love is that worship gives us a small, small, small taste of what heaven's going to be like. We have all these questions about heaven and sometimes the scriptures are very clear about what it's going to be like. Sometimes it's not very clear. We have all these questions like, well, am I going to, like, am I going to, I'm going to get to heaven and I'm just going to go fishing. <laughs> I don't know about you, but when I get to heaven and I see God sitting on his throne and I see, see Jesus sitting in his right hand, the last thing that's gonna be on our minds is some fish in a pond somewhere. Our faces are gonna be to the ground with the elders and the angels singing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. What a beautiful thought that we get a glimpse of what heaven's going to be like, just a small taste, a snippet of what we will experience in the presence of God, in the very tangible, real, physical presence of God. We can kneel at his throne and say, you are holy, God, and you are worthy. And we have the opportunity to partake in that for just a moment. Expression and worship includes the posture of the body and the posture of the heart. I want to pray for us, and we're going to worship together.